Thank you. Can you guys hear me okay through the mic? Awesome. Well, welcome and um, you know, congratulations on investing in your health by coming to this conference. Um, there's, there's great uh, screening opportunities out here. And you know, just my experience has been that men, we do not like going to the doctor. We just don't like going. And so just you guys being here, I think is a testament to you all wanting to invest in your health. Most men I meet are either through the ER or uh, like someone said, uh, most men have a drug problem. Their wives or girlfriends drug them there. Uh, so, but this is um, uh, just going to be a little chat about heart disease in general, but specifically heart attacks, which are our biggest risk. So cardiologists uh, have a broad spectrum of uh, heart-related illnesses that we treat. So it's not just heart attacks. That's actually a fairly small part of what we do. I and mean, we treat heart valve disease, heart rhythm disturbances. Uh, we do preventive work with blood pressure and cholesterol management. We, uh, there's cardiac rehab. There's highly technical advanced stuff that I personally enjoy doing, but hopefully we can kind of keep you from, from that stuff. So when we look at man, man is complex. We shoulder a lot. We uh, you know, have to provide for ourselves, our families. We uh, you know, build things, we tear things down, we're thinkers, we're doers, we're entertainers, we're you know, athletes, and all this um, is just kind of the spectrum of what we do. And if we look at the, the, the life cycle that we hope, all hope to have, we're kind of born, we're dependent on our parents to provide for us. Uh, we have, you know, we start you know, being carried, uh, and then we, uh, you know, start off with teens and early 20s where many of us make mistakes, Brother Bodner, uh, make mistakes, uh, and hopefully we can recover from. But a lot of what we do here can impact what happens in the latter years. And so um, what we usually are hoping to do is to grow to be an old age and then after our story has been written, uh, then we can, we can go to the grave. But we're seeing that this is happening earlier and earlier and earlier in some people. So when I started practice, it was 22 years ago now, when the ER would call me with a 35-year-old man coming in with chest pain, I'd say, well, just, just nothing to it, just probably nothing. But we definitely are seeing heart disease occurring earlier and earlier. So we pay attention to every one of those calls now. And so um, here are some examples. So even Arnold Schwarzenegger was born with uh, an abnormal heart valve. He has two, uh, had two leaflets on his main valve rather than three, and he's had several uh, heart surgeries. Um, we all know this guy, um, uh, Michael uh, Duncan from the Green Mile movie. Remember this guy, uh, John Coffey? He died at actually, he was 54 with a heart attack. Uh, many of you remember John Candy from years ago, the actor, he died at 44. And even John Ritter died age 55 with a unique condition called aortic dissection. And locally, we all know, uh, you know, we've got the PMAC. So Pete Maravich died at age 40 after an illustrious career at LSU and the NBA. So this does happen to younger and younger people. And so we all remember this guy too, Mike Gundy, and he's still alive. He didn't have a heart attack. But, you know, this famous line, I'm a man, I'm 40. You know, there's something about, something about the 40. You know, when I, in, when I turned 40, I spent some time in the mirror and just kind of realized some things were happening. But things do start happening. So, uh, you know, I started wearing glasses. Uh, and my glasses got, my, my prescription got stronger. And I started wearing contacts. Now my eyes are so bad, I, I can't even get contacts at work. Uh, other bodily functions start to change. Uh, blood, as far as the heart goes, blood vessels get stiffer. Uh, there's higher blood pressure readings. Uh, and we all know what the prostate does once, once uh, we, we have all these birthdays. And so speaking of 40, this 40-year-old man went to a gym and asked the trainer, he says, look, I want to impress some beautiful young girls. Which machine should I use to impress the young girls? He says, I got one for you. It's the ATM outside. That will impress them. Uh, so, uh, but anyway, every 40 seconds, someone has a heart attack in this country. Heart disease is the number one killer. Uh, heart, heart disease in general, heart attacks specifically. And this kills more people than cancer and respiratory diseases combined. So this is a, an actual patient of mine. I met him in 2010, uh, and he presented to the Baton Rouge General on Florida Boulevard back then. Uh, he was 55 years old, and he had had chest discomfort on and off for the three days prior. And he walks in and actually collapsed 
in the waiting room. So he hadn't even gotten checked in. And so they put him on a monitor and this is what his heart was doing. These are actual strips from, from his presentation and his heart's just literally quivering. And so this is a fatal heart rhythm. So fortunately, this occurred in a setting in which he was able to be resuscitated. So they shocked his heart. And in the process, they had called me. So I navigated through Baton Rouge traffic, uh, ran up there, we got him to the heart cath lab and found this blockage on the backside of his heart that we were able to treat with a stent and kind of stabilized him. Um, once his tests start coming back, his blood sugar was almost 500. His kidney function was abnormal. His blood pressure, we were fighting with it throughout his stay. We got him through that hospitalization, but he just kind of skipped out on us. Until 2021, he resurfaced, you know, and now he's 66 years old. He's got vascular dementia after having had several strokes. He's got his heart's shot. His kidneys uh, continue to fail. He's got gout. And unfortunately, at 66 years old, he's, he's, he's in a nursing home. And so this is what you don't want to happen. So we are, uh, you know, again, applauding you for being here and investing in your health to try to keep this from, from happening to you. So you can pivot now and make some changes. Again, heart disease is the number one cause of death. There are almost 400,000 deaths a year. Uh, and that's one in every four of us are likely to die uh, from heart disease. So um, some other sobering, sobering statistics, uh, by 2035, it's estimated that there's gonna be 130 million of us who have some form of heart disease. And that includes 18 million who currently do have heart disease and there are almost eight to 900,000 heart attacks each year. And so most of the time when you see a map of the US and we're focusing on Louisiana, it's rarely anything good. And that holds true here. So if you look at heart disease deaths, it's clustered here in the South and the Southeast just because of the way we live and eat and do here. And so heart disease accounts for one in four deaths here in the state. We have the fifth highest uh, cardiovascular death rate in the US um, and about specifically 14,000 each year. And so um, even if you look further, this is a, I had this data pulled by uh, one of the medical companies. And this is a look at just the zip codes that encompass Baton Rouge General Blue Bonnet, Our Lady of the Lake, and Baton Rouge General Mid-City. And so this is looking at coronary heart disease and peripheral artery disease or chronic limb ischemia. And so just in those zip codes, the incidence of coronary disease and peripheral disease is double the national average. So the national average 4.8, almost 10% of the population in the zip code has coronary disease, has peripheral disease. Um, and so that just uh, kind of shows the magnitude of it in our community here. And so I want to spend the majority of the rest of the talk on heart attacks, the risks, and its prevention. So what is a heart attack? It's when actually there's damage or death to a part of the, the heart muscle. And this usually occurs from plaque buildup inside the arteries that suddenly becomes unstable in some fashion. Uh, this, this is, uh, uh, you know, it's also our term, we call it a myocardial infarction or MI. And this is uh, another patient who came in with a heart attack and the arrows show that there is a complete blockage of this right coronary artery right here, that, again, that we were able to open up with the balloon or stent. And so again, the, the heart needs blood circulating through these arteries to do its job of pumping blood to our organs, our brain, our kidneys, our liver, our extremities. Um, and so it's the buildup of this plaque that you know, allows for that, uh, th that, that, um, th that causes problems that can lead to heart attacks. So the heart can't get enough blood or oxygen and often can produce symptoms. So this is a diagram of what the heart's arteries look like. There's the left and the right artery with secondary branches and it's plaque buildup in these arteries that leads to these events. And so it starts off with what we call the fatty streak that occurs inside the wall, inside the lining of the heart. And this can develop even when we're back in our teen years and, and early 20s. So this is a process that starts at, at usually a very young age. And it's been even demonstrated in, in young military recruits that this goes on even long decades before there's an event. And so something happens between one day and the next where the plaque can become unstable. And there's a lot of work done 
trying to figure out why a stable plaque becomes unstable. And, and this is still not completely understood why this is one day and this is the next. But if this occurs, this sets off a cascade, and this is just like any other nick or cut that you might have on your skin, and you, you, know, you, you don't bleed to death typically with that, so you get some cells and substances to try to stop the bleeding. So inside the blood vessel, there's a lot of activity that goes on when this rupture occurs. So if a clot forms on top of that and it only partially occludes the blood vessel, you may have a chest pain syndrome, you may have a small heart attack, but if it completely closes off the blood vessel, that's usually bells and whistles and you're feeling really poorly having a heart attack and there can be damage or death to the part of the heart below that uh, below that blockage so this process again tends to occur over the course of time and depending on your individual risk the more risk factors that you have the earlier in life that this can occur the fewer risk factors that you have or if you can modify them this can be pushed to later and hopefully never occurring at all but this is just a look at how this process occurs. So what are the symptoms? How do you know if you're having a heart attack? Well, everybody remembers this guy. Oh, uh, Red Fox was a clown, but he did actually a very good job of illustrating what a patient who's having uh, heart pain experiences. So typically is pain in the center of the chest. And actually, you know, those of you who don't know, he actually died from a heart attack while he was uh, filming. Um, but it's typically pain in the central area of the chest or the left side. It can go into the jaw, the neck, the arm, or the back. Um, and it's, it's related to that lack of blood flow to the key areas of the heart. Um, and so the characteristics are typically pressure, heaviness, tightness, fullness, squeezing, rather than sharp, stinging, sticking, uh, sudden lasting a second. It usually lasts minutes. It can be associated with shortness of breath or nausea. It can go into your jaw, your neck, or your arm or back. Uh, it's a little worse if you're exerting yourself and it tends to go away or get better with rest. Those are the classic symptoms. Um, not everybody has those classic symptoms, but these are the symptoms that we try to decipher if you come in to, for an evaluation of chest dis discomfort. And usually it's very, very intense. So people have an uneasiness and a sense of something really bad when this is going on. So, um, but if you think you're having a heart attack, if you think you're having one, get checked out. So we have a saying, a time is muscle. So uh, we would encourage you, if you really think you're having one, to take aspirin uh, and, call, and call for help, call 911. And there's a campaign, and we'll get to it in a minute, uh, that you should call 911 rather than trying to drive yourself. But it shows that time is muscle, so if you can get in and get treated, then usually we can restore blood flow e by either procedures or medications that can preserve your heart muscle, because that has a huge implication in terms of how you're going to feel if, if you can survive the heart attack, how you might feel and how your, your heart is going to function after this. So if you can get in early and we can get the problem fixed, usually you, you go away unscathed. But if there's a delay, either like you don't know, you're just thinking it's indigestion, you're sitting and waiting and you decide, well, I'm busy today or LSU's playing, I'll just, I'll go tomorrow. You know, first of all, it may not be a tomorrow, but if, if you do come and there's damage, then there's only so much we're able to do at that point. So if you think you're having one, call 911. There's a campaign, Don't Drive, Arrive Alive, that says if you think you're having a heart attack, you do better by coming by, by EMS rather than driving yourself. You get back in the ER quicker, you get evaluated, you get an immediate EKG. Um, you know, we're, we're on committees at the hospitals and so we have a mandate upon ourselves that you hit the door, you get an EKG within five minutes if you're complaining of chest pain. And so, um, and we, we're, we hold ourselves to those standards because we don't wanna miss someone having a heart attack. Um, uh, because of that time is muscle phenomenon. So um, now the treatment is gonna ba be based upon where you go. Now we're fortunate to have uh, hospitals here in Baton Rouge that are capable of going in urgently with these balloon and stent catheters. If you live out in more rural areas, then this is not always readily available. So sometimes transfer is necessary if that's gonna be reasonable. And if not, there are clot busting drugs that can be administered that can achieve the same thing. It's just uh, how we go about doing this. And there's a mandate, there's, there's a standard by which every hospital is graded and um, a mandate that we've 
placed upon ourselves that if someone hits the door with a heart attack, it's expected that we're going to uh, have things in place to get that artery open, certainly within 90 minutes. And that's, this is a minimum standard. Most of us are striving for less than 60. And, and actually, I'm on staff at the Lake and the General, and we are, our daughter balloon times are less than 60 minutes at both those hospitals. So, um, uh, and, and that's public information. You can look, you can look that up. So, and it's all because if, you, if, you, if your heart attack is not treated, we can lose you, uh, you can develop organ failure, uh, or your heart can be, can be what's called a cardiac cripple for the rest of your life. And so we, de we definitely want to avoid that. You can be left with congestive heart failure, bad heart valves and such, if you're not uh, treated accordingly in a timely uh, fashion. So, you know, we uh, go through rigorous training to do this stuff, and I've been in practice 22 years now, uh, which 22 years of practice after investing four or three, all this time. Um, and so, you know, we've seen a lot and, and do a lot. So when patients come with a 30 second Google search and start asking questions, we have to, you know, take it with a grain of salt. So th this actually happened this month. Uh, a patient came and said, a doctor on the internet said that cholesterol is not the problem. Now this patient uh, has eight blockages. So I, it's hard for me to take advice from somebody with this when, when you know, he's, he's just kind of done a Google search. So I, I do encourage each of you to ask questions of your physician and whatever he or she has told you, it has to make sense to you, it has to be logical, and there's nothing wrong with challenging or questioning, but you know, you know, we all have experiences that we're bringing to the patient, and we, it, it takes a lot, so um, <laughs> I kind of chuckled at that. So what is the, what, what, who's at risk for heart attack? Well, it's the number one killer, so we all technically are at risk. But if you take anything away from today, this is the slide that kind of shows the classic risk factors for developing heart disease. So if you have high blood pressure, if you have high cholesterol, if you are diabetic, if you're a smoker, those are the four major, major risk factors for developing heart disease. And so the more of these you have, the greater your risk, particularly if these risk factors are uncontrolled. There are some secondary risk factors, being overweight, uh, having birthdays or having a family history, particularly a premature family history and, and younger relatives, not so much if your grandfather had a heart attack at 90, but if you you know, have a sibling that may have had a heart attack at 50 or a parent that had a heart attack at a young age, that's very relevant to us, not only just from the genetics, but also similar lifestyles that families tend to, tend to follow. So we'll go through a few of these yet. We'll, we'll um, just save it, sell, save it till the end, if you don't mind. We'll, we'll be through this in just a minute, and, and you'll be first. So we'll go through a few of these. High blood pressure uh, affects 50 million Americans. It's a very prevalent illness, uh, over a billion people worldwide, and it's responsible for one in eight uh, deaths. Uh, one in three adults in Louisiana has high blood pressure. Um, this is a chart that shows what the normal blood pressure readings uh, should be. So it should be 120 over 80 or less for most. Now, not everybody can tolerate a blood pressure that's super tightly controlled, um, but these are the general guidelines that we try to follow in, um, in, in achieving good blood pressure control. Um, so this is another, another real patient of mine who actually came a couple of weeks ago. After I met him in 2017, he had gone to the ER. He was 57 at that time. With these illnesses, he had run out of his blood pressure medicines. We did an evaluation, everything was fine. His heart was his fine, his, all of his blood tests were really unremarkable. And he came for a couple of visits and you know, we got his blood pressure pretty good. And so he kind of disappeared uh, for a little bit and came back in 2019, pressure was high again. He kind of ran out of his medicines again. It was just like, yeah, I don't like taking that stuff. And again, 2020, if anything, his pressure's gone up. And so he just came this month with a pressure of 195 over 100 and the tests that were normal in 2017, now his heart's enlarged and his labs show that his kidneys are failing. And so these illnesses have to be taken seriously because they can impact your health. Um, and so again, not every pill is for every patient, but the ultimate goal is to decrease the likelihood of these illnesses uh, taking a toll on your organs. So there are ways that you can uh, favorably impact your blood pressure without 
you know, this is over and above medications that may be necessary. You can um, get active, you can cut uh, your alcohol intake, your sodium intake. Uh, certain minerals like potassium, magnesium have a favorable impact on blood pressure control. Uh, you can stop smoking and limiting fat and cholesterol. What about diabetes? This is big and it's a growing problem. There are uh, about 30 million people, over 30 million people with diabetes in the U.S. and that includes seven almost seven and a half million that are underdiagnosed or not, not yet diagnosed. And if you extend that to the pre-diabetic population, we're talking 88 million. And so you think about this, carbohydrates are everywhere. They're, they're everywhere. They're, if you go down the grocery store aisle and just about anything that you pick up is gonna be really heavy on these carbs. So you gotta get used to, to reading food labels um, and, and you know, carbohydrates are a big 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 deal in our diet and so this is present in one out of four patients who suffer a heart attack and most diabetics are going to eventually succumb to some form of vascular disease and that includes heart attack stroke or peripheral artery disease and this is uh, just showing the same thing that most heart attack patients you know statistically many not most many of them will have diabetes uh, those who've had a heart attack or stroke and those who are found to have uh, coronary disease. And so you just want to uh, keep that blood sugar around 100, keep that A1C, six or less. Um, high cholesterol is another risk factor. If you look at your neighbor and see this plaque build up around their eyes, they probably have high cholesterol. If you look in the mirror uh, as well. Um, cholesterol is a necessary component of our uh, bloodstream and, and, and our bodies for, for uh, cell function, but it can build up in excess and that can predispose to, to uh, uh, clogging the arteries. So this comes from either uh, production in the liver or from dietary intake, usually from animal sources. And so um, if you consume a diet that's very high in cholesterol, there is a risk that this stuff can uh, accumulate in the arteries. And so, you know, we could say a lot about all the different components. Just generally speaking, there's good cholesterol and bad cholesterol. So the good cholesterol tends to keep the bad plaque from building up in the arteries and the bad cholesterol is, is the villain, it's the bad player and it's the main source of plaque buildup. So again, too much of it can cause problems with heart attack, poor circulation, stroke, um, get used to reading food labels and cutting back on saturated fat. So this, these are the guidelines for uh, cholesterol. So at a minimum, you want your total cholesterol less than 200. Men should strive to get their good cholesterol levels up above 40. Um, and that can be achieved by you know, exercise um, and, and, and maybe so what we call these omega-3 fatty acids. We want your bad cholesterol less than 100. And triglycerides are another fatty component of the bloodstream. Um, so limiting alcohol, limiting carbohydrates, and exercise can all help these, these things. And so if you're diabetic, we want your, your, your bad cholesterol even, even tighter, or if you have established vascular disease. What about smoking? Another major, major risk factor. So the statistics show that uh, about a quarter of us smoke. Uh, most people start smoking at a very young age. This is the leading modifiable risk factor. And the good news is that if you quit smoking, things get better. So if you stay abstinent from smoking for a year, there's a 50% there's a reduction in cardiac risk. And if you abstain for 15 years, your risk is, is approaching that of a, a non-smoker. And so this is the best thing you can do is avoiding cigarettes if you want to protect your vascular system. And this includes vaping um, and also secondhand smoke exposure is, is big and relevant. So if you do have a smoker in your home, you would do yourself a favor by asking them to, to step outside if they're going to smoke. Um, what about other less traditional risk factors? So again, if you have a family history of it, if you have metabolic syndrome or prediabetes, if you have chronic kidney disease or even other inflammatory disorders like lupus, psoriasis, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, HIV disease, peripheral artery disease, all these are kind of uh, illnesses that can coexist and increase your uh, cardiac disease risk. Being overweight, and these are definitions that are used, the so body mass index is your weight for height. And so 25 to 29 is considered overweight and a BMI over 30 is considered obese. So obesity is associated with other things in addition to heart disease. There's arthritis, certain cancers, um, diabetes, gallbladder disease, respiratory illnesses, et cetera. And again, another map with showing that the distribution of obesity is very prevalent in our, in our area. So, but 
there are things you can do. Again, you know, this is, the news is not all bad. There are things you can do. Many of these risk factors are modifiable. You can, you can get active. You can modify your diet. You can lose weight. You can control your blood pressure. Um, you know, just limiting saturated fat in the diet is the main way to go about this. Again, being mindful of some of the other disorders that go along with, with carbohydrate excess. Um, Oops. Um, and so these are some guidelines from the American Heart Association. So most of your protein in intake should come from plants, uh, legumes and nuts, uh, you know, maybe beans and peas rather than red meat. Um, again, be careful with deli meats. So processed meat, there's this heavily, heavily processed meats, um, you know, can predispose to vascular disease, inflammation maybe even some, some cancers. Um, seafood, as we know in Louisiana, there's only two types of seafood. There's fried fish and fried cat, fried catfish. That's all, fried shrimp and fried catfish. But, you know, we should uh, broaden that to include healthier fish like salmon, tuna, trout, and it should be grilled, broiled, or baked and not fried like we like to do it here. So what about uh, oils? And so you should choose these items from the left side of the screen uh, rather than those on the right for cooking. And you should, you know, again, if you're going to use these, just use them as, as a light saute and not, you know, not frying. Uh, and so these are some other cooking tips. Watch being careful with casseroles and these ready-made dishes that may be high in what we call trans fats. And so um, just trying to make better food choices. And this should not be anything that you consume on any kind of regular basis. Uh, and we won't tell you where this came from, but this was, this was from a local restaurant. <laughs> uh, but, yeah. So, but that should not be your your norm. And what about alcohol? So, you know, alcohol is certainly part of the culture here in our state. I grew up in New Orleans, and so this was at every gathering. There's food and alcohol, and so you just have to be mindful and, and limit this. The Heart Association's position is: if you don't drink, don't start. If you do drink, uh, moderation. Uh, alcohol can be associated with blood pressure problems with a heart rhythm disturbance called AFib um, in, in excess, uh, hemorrhagic stroke, and that's not even speaking to liver disease and other, other things. And it used to be thought that, oh, a drink a day would reduce your heart disease risk, but the Heart Association does not endorse alcohol as any therapy. Uh, so the other type of drink that you have to be careful of is the carbohydrate-laden drink. And so sodas, uh, you know, fruit juices, you know, we're in Louisiana, so we love sweet tea. Uh, but these drinks can really put a lot of calories in your diet and a very high sugar content. So this kind of shows just the number of teaspoons of sugar in various drinks. A soda, just imagine 10 teaspoons of sugar in a, in a 12 ounce can of soda. Uh, you know, energy drinks have, many of them have high carbohydrate and sugar contents. And so just be mindful of that as you are choosing what you drink and probably you're best off just drinking water most of the time. And so what about activity? The Heart Association again endorses 150 minutes a week of some uh, moderate intensity exercise. So that's 20, 30 minutes most days of the week. And then even build into that a couple of minutes of vigorous activity. Um, and so it could be walking, biking, swimming, jogging. So whatever you know you're going to stay engaged with, whether you like working out alone or whether you like group classes or if you got a workout buddy or someone to keep you accountable, that's the best way to go about it. Um, and you can even try simple things like parking farther, using the stairs rather than the elevator, um, yard work around your home and just plan it to take a walk after supper rather than just kind of laying on the couch and, uh, you know, getting caught up in social media or television. Um, Physical activity can, can do a lot of good. It can reduce your blood pressure, can reduce your cholesterol, your blood sugar, uh, it can help you lose weight. And I like to tell patients it's a gauge for us. So for instance, if you can jog for a couple of miles, and I know things are probably stable with your heart. If you are having trouble with the activity that you're used to maintaining, that tells us something's changing. And so we probably need to do an investigation if, if your activity tolerance is, is declining. So these are just some definitions. Modern intensity exercise would be an activity that you can probably still hold a conversation while you're doing, whereas vigorous exercise would be something where you're having trouble talking while you're doing it. Um, and, so, and so putting it simply, these are just the general things 
uh, that can guide you in ways you can reduce your heart disease risk. So eating right, getting more active, stopping smoking. Uh, we didn't talk much about sleep, but sleep can have an imp impact on your blood pressure, uh, your, your ability to reset, uh, managing weight, cholesterol, blood sugar, and blood pressure. So those are, those are the major ways we can help reduce our heart disease risk. So remember, the news is not all bad. Many of these risk factors are modifiable. Um, you can decrease your risk for uh, heart disease by reducing all those uh, variables that we uh, spoke about. I'm often asked when you should see a cardiologist and the answer is not, there's not one straightforward answer. It really depends on your risk profile. Um, you know, if you've been dealing with blood pressure and cholesterol, particularly we're very, very uh, concerned with people who've had long-standing diabetes. I'll tell you, diabetes and smoking are probably the two biggest risk factors that gets a cardiologist's attention. And just do not ignore warning signs. So if your body's talking to you, then you got to listen. And do not be that man that's afraid to go to the doctor. Ask questions. Make sure things make sense when you do see them. Um, everybody knows Stuart Scott from ESPN. He was famous for saying booyah uh, when, when we saw a big play. But uh, he also said, life is nothing more than two dates with a dash in between. And so, you know, some of you came in late and missed the first slide where we showed this, where you know, this is the normal transition. Well, I'm working to try to keep my dash in the middle long. So that's it. We'll uh, answer any questions. You know, we have the gentleman in the hat on the left head. head. It was just on Yes, sir. Three more slides you covered. So, uh, yeah, you had the information. Okay, yeah. I quit. Good. About 13. Yeah, smoking. Um, yeah, yeah. So, it's glad that the tough part is quitting. Most people after a heart attack are motivated at that time, but that motivation tends to fade once they get back into their, into their environments. Um, so, I'm glad you quit. Yes, sir. Yeah, I have high cholesterol. Yes, sir. Taking statins for years, and I'm reading about how harmful they can be. What's the story on that? So there, yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of information out there about statins. Um, mostly good. So we do know, without uh, unequivocally, that statins can reduce heart attack risk, can reduce stroke risk. Um, you know, practically speaking, is some people get a little muscle aching. Um, there's, there, there initially was a lot of concern about liver disease, which is exceedingly, exceedingly rare. Um, there have been some reports and questions raised about what statins might mean in the long term. Particularly, there's some blips about dementia and blips, blips about diabetes in the long term. But the recommendation to prescribe a statin for someone long term is really dependent upon their you know risk and that they're primarily meant to decrease the risk of vascular events like heart attack or stroke and so the weight of evidence really leans more in favor of them being safe for long term use because i think some of that um, some of the questions about dementia and diabetes are still not fully settled so my real answer is, you know, if I've got a patient who's had blockage, had a vascular event, I'm very comfortable with them being on a statin long term. Um, the dementia question is, you know, there's so many, I mean, you hear, you know, fish and, you know, mineral. It's just there's so much that we just still don't know about that. Uh, nobody wants dementia, obviously. And, you know, for those of us who've had it in their family, it's, I mean, it's sometimes having someone you know, succumb to dementia is, is, is more painful to watch than someone having a physical ailment. Um, but I think it's still not fully settled. Yes, sir. My wife continues to, um, to ask in, about me getting a calcium test. Uh -huh. um, GP says, I don't see the reason for it. Um, if you could speak to that. I mean, my, I have a, my family history. My dad passed away at 55, but he smoked four packs of unfiltered cigarettes most of his life. Mm -hmm. I don't, I've never smoked. You know, I'm on, high, I've, I've had high blood pressure, but I'm, they're under control. But um, is there value in it as a cardiologist? And if you could speak to um, 
somebody who may have other issues, when do you, how do you make that determination if somebody needs that or not? Yeah. Long so, question, but. Yeah, so this is, is, a, is a great question because someone brought it up last session. Okay. And so if you put four physicians in a room and ask that question, you're gonna get eight different answers. <laughs> Uh, my bias is it's a it's a good test for many um, I've done one of my, that was about my 50th birthday present to myself was a calcium scan I've done a, one on my wife and my mother and my aunt because it gives me comfort to know that when a score is zero or low and so a calcium test for you guys don't know it's a it's a cat scan that looks for the deposition of plaque in or around the arteries of your heart and so the computer software gives a score that can go from zero to infinity. And so the data is that if your score is zero or low, then you're at very low risk. So that's unequivocal and there's science and research to support that. And so maybe not everybody needs one. So again, if you're 85, it may not be as helpful a test. If you're 25, probably not a helpful test. But you know, for those of us in the middle, my bias is that it is a good snapshot that has to be part of the overall assessment of your risk profile. So again, you know, if you are, you know, 50, you know, and then looking across the room, most of us are somewhere between, you know, 35 and 80 in this room. And so the bulk of us, there could be some information gathered. Um, and it also, going back to this gentleman's question about a statin, I, this is how I use it sometimes. Doc, I don't know, I hear there's all this noise. I don't want to take Lipitor. I just don't want to take it. And I'll say, well, look, let's do this calcium test. And I'll tell you, we can, we can have more discussion about it after we get this test. So if your score is zero, you've got time to help, to get, help yourself through you know, where your cholesterol levels are. But if your score is 900, you're already behind the eight ball. And in that patient who may have some hesitation in wanting to take a statin, I'm gonna say, look, sir or ma'am, we're already, we're already behind here, so we need to do everything we can to try to mitigate some of this. So I think it is a good test um, in, the, in the right patient. Yeah. Yes, sir. Hey, uh, two parts. Can you pull back up the, uh, the, um, the slide that had your cholesterol levels where they should be? And, um, this is a total of 200. Oh, sorry. Less <laughs> okay. Uh, I want to take a picture of it. <laughs> Yeah, uh, your your LDL under preferably under one hundred. Okay. Um, yeah, if it's difficult to locate, don't worry about it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, uh, yeah no, that one. So yeah. So All right. now, um, you know, really, a hundred is desirable. You know, we, you know, most ranges you'll see under one thirty, but we really would like to push it. Uh, under 100, the, the LDL under 100, if we could. Okay, and then my uh, second part of question. Uh, I heard you talk earlier about um, like carbohydrates and like they could be bad for you and everything. Um, I know in a lot of people who do like strenuous workouts, like I'm an avid, avid distance runner. I know you and are. And they say like, you know, like carb loading or whatever, where they talk about, you know, you load up on carbs and everything to get that energy. Would you say that is like not recommended in the medical field when it comes to you know mm -hmm. like people who are doing intense workouts or distance running no i think that's that's a different question than um the regular consumption of this stuff like um you know if you're you know and uh, mr robinson is he was being humble saying he's into running he wins some of these races here in town if you look him up but um if you're carb loading for training and exercise that's different but the message is really uh, about like sodas and you know cookies and crackers and things like that that just and even some of these um, energy drinks that have a lot of sodium so yeah I mean if you're just using them to replenish or to kind of boost in preparation for something that's going to be of high demand like that that's different than someone who consumes sweet tea with every meal um, and, and that's really what we're trying to discourage and you know but generally you should choose water over you know some of these drinks that are laden in high uh, with this high carbohydrate content because it can do things metabolically to you that can be disadvantageous. Yes, sir. 
I assume there's still a, um, a recommendation uh, for a baby aspirin per day. And if that's true, uh, is there a age where we should quit? So aspirin, and again, this came up previous session too, so, uh, but, but aspirin is a very interesting uh, topic. Now, sometimes things in medicine come full circle and then circle again. So many of you can recall being told years ago, because you were a certain age, take an aspirin a day. And it used to be, uh, you know, there were conferences of cardiologists where they would take a poll of the physicians in the room, how many of you take aspirin? And most would raise their hands. But actually, we backpedaled on that a little bit. So that, for, and there's a distinction to be made between primary prevention and secondary prevention. So aspirin for primary prevention has come into question. So to just tell a patient because they're 45, let's just say, or 50, take an aspirin without there being any other, you know, good reason, that, that's really come into question and we're actually discouraged from doing that. Now, if you have vascular disease, if you have a calcium score that's 400, if you're, um, you know, got poor circulation, those are different, or if you've had a heart attack, a stent, a stroke, you, yes, aspirin for sure. But for primary prevention, and you can look at the latest, there is, um, we've been discouraged from recommending that because aspirin comes at a cost of certain things. Let's just say your risk for having a heart attack and their formula and you know, apps and algorithms, we can plug in your age, your blood pressure, your cholesterol, your diabetes and calculate your 10 year risk for having a coronary event. Let's just say that risk is one or 2% um, over the next 10 years. And if we say, okay, sir, we're going to put you on an aspirin, so you're not really gaining that much, so we can maybe reduce your risk from 1% to a half a percent, but at the same time, there may be a 1% or 2 or 3% risk that the aspirin itself could cause ulcers or internal bleeding or something else. And so it just really depends on your risk profile, but you know, aspirin is not totally, totally innocuous. Aspirin does have a, a little bit of risk, and so... Uh, for primary prevention, it's come into question recently. Now, if you think you're having a heart attack, I'd say take four baby aspirin or one full strength aspirin if you think you're having a heart attack. Uh, if you have a stent in, you need to be on an aspirin. If you've had a stroke if, or you've had a heart attack, you should probably be on aspirin. But just to take it every day, it's come into question. Yes, sir, in the back. Yes, I want to ask, uh, is on? I want to ask, like, say, like, uh, they were saying, like, when you eat, most of the time when people eat, the first thing they do, they want to drink a cold drink, or, you know, a cold, cold drink, or eat a uh, cold water, something with their meal or whatever. I was told that when you do that, that affects your heart or whatever, for us, you eating the food and that cold drink mess with your heart, for us, digesting or whatever. So, is there any truth to that or whatever? Uh, not so much in terms of a direct impact on the heart from the, you know, it's more the choice of thing that you drink, I think is more uh, of an impact. So again, that may take a shift in behavior to, you know, get used to just maybe drinking water with your meals rather than a soda or, you know, I mean, again, we like sweet tea here. We like Kool-Aid, we like all that, but, but that stuff over the course of time, you know, that exposure to, and, and, and we kind of went right by the this, this slide with, with, the, with the sugar content, but that's, I mean, that's real. I mean, that's a lot of, that's a lot of carbs that uh, you can be regularly exposed to. Uh, I mean, if you, if you and then and even those of us who drink coffee, I mean, even in your coffee, you can dump a lot of, you know, these flavored creamers and sugar um, can really change the, nutritional profile of things that that we're used to drinking so and these are teaspoons of sugar that you know if you get get you know kool-aid with every meal that that's a lot i had an aunt that uh i swear she made the best lemonade that i've ever tasted and it was really all about the sugar and you know, this aunt had the worst diabetes and you know she she frankly i'm mean, not be funny she lost her she lost her leg and then she lost her her life to diabetes and this was every single time i went there she had this very sweet lemonade i love going over there and 
So, yes, sir. sir. So it won't make a dip if it's cold. The, it's no, cold. the temperature, no, sir. The water, so it's cold water is fine. The, then. The, yeah, cold oh. water is fine. And wa water is water is fine. Yes, sir. What about if you use honey to sweeten the tea? Uh, yeah, so just in moderation, in moderation. And some people ask about artificial sweeteners, which I, you know, a little little hesitant about that too. So, but there there's still some metabolic changes that can go along with other sweeteners too. So, um, but certainly that would be better than, than sugar. Yes, sir. Um, elephant in the room, I guess. Um, <laughs> I enjoy probably three beers a week or mm -hmm. something like that. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I, I go to the gym three times, play pickleball three times a week, but there's not much on alcohol. Bad for me, it's got sugar in it and everything, but to what extent? So, uh, so three beers a week would still technically be in line with um, you know, it's just in moderation. I'd say most of us would agree that three beers a week would be a moderate, uh, you know, light or moderate amount. <clears throat> it used to be the Heart Association would say that they defined, you know, alcohol consumption as like a beer, a glass of wine, a shot, or a mixed beverage per day. But they've kind of softened that message some. So three a week is is okay. But yeah, and and, and then even within that, you can choose. Things that are, you know, lower in carb, uh, lower in sugar um, than, than than some others. Right. Oh, we have what we one do more. have time for. Yes, sir. One. Yes, we do. I'm coming. I don't need that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you think saying aspirin helps your blood flow and everything? I've seen that through many years with people with problems. You were talking there was a, some medication that you could take that helps go in and clean your arteries. Why not take, do that once a year, basically, to clean the arteries out? Uh, well, so there's a lot of um, uncertainty about really, and I'm not sure exactly what specific medicine you're talking about. There are some cholesterol medications that can be administered once or twice a month, and even one once or twice a year. But I wouldn't say that there's definite evidence that it cleans your arteries out. We actually need that discovery we need something that can remove plaque we don't have now we can mechanically drill through it we got you know things to shave it down but that doesn't remove it you know from the system which is really what we need so that is whoever finds that is a nobel prize winner for sure because that's 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 really what we need so even all these things that we've talked about hardening of the arteries uh, tends to be a progressive disease so once you get it there's a great likelihood that it's going to progress. So even patients who take statins, take aspirin, control their blood pressure, it's still, this stuff can still progress. Maybe not at the rate that it would have progressed without control of those things, uh, but we do need something like you're suggesting. I, I don't know what that is because we, we, we'd, be, we'd be prescribing it. Aspirin doesn't remove it. Aspirin stabilizes some of the behavior on the inside. Cholesterol medicines stabilize some of this stuff. Um, it can actually, there have been studies to show that some cholesterol medicines can cause it to regress, but none have shown that it totally removes the blockage. Um, and that's what we need. In addition to keeping it from developing, we, if, if we had something on the back end to, to remove it, we, we'd be winning. All right. Thank you so much. <clears throat> you. Dr. Lamotte volunteered his time to be here this morning, and I'm sure that we all appreciated it. Let's show our appreciation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.